Good morning, uh, everyone. Um, we are beginning our webinar and conversation on anti-Blackness, anti-Black racism, white privilege, and allyship. And I'm really happy to be co-moderating this conversation with my colleague, Shauna Cooper. I'm Kia Caldwell, and I am uh, a professor in the Department of African, African American, and Diaspora Studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I'm also a co-principal investigator for Team Advance, which is organizing this conversation today and the special assistant to the provost for Team Advance. And I'll be talking a little bit more about Team Advance, but I do want to um, turn the uh, sort of mic over to Shauna, Dr. Shauna Cooper, and allow her to introduce herself as well. Shauna. Good morning, uh, almost afternoon. I am Shauna Cooper, Associate Professor in the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience. I'm also Director of Diversity Initiatives for the department. And for the past year, I've been working with Team Advance around issues of gender equity and intersectionality in relation to mentoring and training. Um, so as Kia said, I am happy that we have a great panel, uh, four thought leaders from across our campus com community who are going to be discussing issues of anti-Black racism, white privilege, and allyship with us this morning. Thank you, Shauna. So I will talk a little bit about Team Advance and the work that we're doing. Um, we do have a few slides as well to sort of introduce the programming that we offer. Team Advance is a National Science Foundation uh, funded grant. We're currently in year two of a two of a three year, excuse me, grant, which focuses on mentoring for women in STEM, STEM fields, so science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, but we really are providing a lot of mentoring support across the campus that is informed by racial and gender, a racial and gender equity lens, as well as intersectionality. So the conversation that we're having today is really uh, and it really resonates well with the work that we're doing um, with Team Advance as we think through current events that are rapidly changing sort of the landscape of our country and our cultural and national discourse. So I believe we have a couple of slides. Are they available to share? And I want to thank our staff who's helping um, and has worked a lot behind the scenes to bring this webinar to fruition. So Jonathan Folan, who's our research project manager, and Yasmin um, Barrios, uh, who's a research assistant, as well as um, Brianka Taylor. Can we go to the next slide, please? So uh, the panelists today are Dr. Sharon P. Holland from American Studies, Dr. William Sturkey from History, Dr. Heidi Kim from English and Comparative Literature, and Dr. Mark Katz from Music. They are all faculty at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Next slide, please. This slide provides an overview of our team advanced programs, um, really to sort of let our UNC Chapel Hill community know um, what we're doing. And I do believe that we have quite a few um, team advanced participants uh, who are watching the webinar today. So our goal and our mission is really to catalyze a culture of active, equitable, and effective mentoring for faculty across the university and across social identities. We do this by offering programming and workshops to department chairs, as well as providing um, all kinds of support to faculty for mentoring through mentoring workshops and a faculty mentorship program and peer mentoring circles for early career faculty which is part of our objective four and support for mid-career uh, women faculty who are fixed term or tenured. And I believe we might have one more slide with our contact information. So you can contact us at teamadvance at unc.edu. We also are on Twitter and Facebook and our website is cfe.unc.edu slash teamadvance um, and backslash after that. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. So as we think about our goals today, uh, we really thought this would be an important time to have a conversation, uh, thinking through the rapid changes that we're seeing take place in our country, across the United States, as well as on our campus. If we think about the lifting of the building renaming moratorium by the Board of Trustees uh, last week, and 
you know, everything from the definition of racism in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary to uh, the Band-Aid brand now offering a range of different colors of Band-Aids, something that was sort of put on hold several years ago, to the Aunt Jemima and uh, Uncle Ben and cream of wheat symbology and symbolism uh, being pulled off of our store shelves, I think speak to the urgency of us, of us all better understanding um, white privilege as well as understanding anti-Blackness and anti-Black racism and how to be better allies, um, particularly to African-Americans uh, and other people of color. So with that, I will turn the floor, the mic back over to Shauna, who will um, help us move into the first part of our conversation. Thank you, Kia. Um, and so I will agree with Kia, and I also will say is that I think, you know, these issues are issues that many of us have had or, and are having in this moment, um, not just related to broader events, but also our campus and local community. Um, and so I think if there is one goal, one primary goal from our conversation is that this will be an ongoing dialogue, an ongoing dialogue that is closely aligned with action and societal change. Uh, with that said, we will have our panelists briefly introduce themselves and get into today's discussion. Uh, we've left around 30 minutes for qu question and answer, period. Uh, some of these questions were submitted last week. However, we will be able to see any questions that come up during the course of our conversation today. Looking forward to this uh, important and much needed conversation with all of you. And we can start with Mark for introductions or Heidi. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, I am Heidi Kim. I'm an associate professor in the Department of English and Comparative Literature. I also co-facilitate with Kia Caldwell, the uh, Indigenous Faculty and Faculty of Color Working Group at the Institute for the Arts and Humanities at UNC. Um, I currently serve on the Provost Committee for the Asian American Center, which will hopefully open soon. And uh, outside of UNC, I am the chair of the board of North Carolina Asian Americans Together, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan advocacy and civic engagement group. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Katz. Uh, I'm a professor of music here at UNC Chapel Hill. I'm currently the director of graduate studies in my department. I'm a former chair of the music department and former director of the Institute for the Arts and Humanities. And um, I had the, uh, the pleasure of working uh, with uh, Kia uh, Caldwell, as well as Michelle Berger and Jennifer Ho to develop the Faculty of Color and Indigenous Faculty Working Group at the IH that Heidi mentioned. Um, my involvement in issues of race uh, stem mostly from my work um, as a scholar and um, sort of uh, um, activist in hip hop, and um, I'm also the founding director of a program called Next Level, which is a government-funded um, international uh, cultural diplomacy program that focuses on hip hop. William, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. My name is William Sturkey. I am a professor in the Department of History. I study the history of race in the American South. In the last few years, I've been involved in dealing with um, what I've seen to be really nothing short of a public history crisis all over our campus. So there's a lot to unpack there. And Sharon, please introduce yourself. Yes, um, thank you very much. I'm really happy to be here with my colleagues. Thanks for all those who are tuning in. I'm Sharon P. Holland. I'm a professor in American Studies. I'm the convener of the Critical Ethnic Studies Collective, and I am also going to be incoming chair of American Studies. Um, my community work right now is to manage, along with community activists, uh, QTI POC. If you don't know that acronym, it's Queer Trans. Indigenous People of Color Survival Fund um, to help support members of our community in crisis. Um, and I'll leave it there. 
Thanks, everyone. So this is really an illustrious uh, panel, an esteemed panel, and we're lucky to have them uh, be in conversation with us. And we do hope this will be a conversation. So in terms of the format, we're looking to have about 45 minutes of conversation based on questions that Shauna and I have generated, as well as several that were sent ahead of time by people, um, attendees who registered for this event. And then that will be followed by about 30 minutes of additional questions and conversation with the audience. So please uh, send your questions via the Q&A chat here on the webinar on Zoom, and we will try to get to as many of them as possible. And uh, so let's get started with our questions. Um, the first question is about how our panelists uh, define anti-Black racism. So how do you define anti-Black racism and how have you seen anti-Black racism manifested in both symbolic and material ways in the U.S. historically and in the current moment contemporarily? And please also feel free to discuss how anti-Blackness intersects with sexism, heterosexism, and transphobia, as well as other forms of difference and oppression. Um, Sharon, would could you start that conversation for us, that part of the conversation for us, please? Sure, I'd be happy to. I'm gonna take the first part, which is the definition of anti-Black racism and see if maybe other folks in the panel wanna to, want to join in with their definitions and then maybe we could go to the second part. But um, for me, um, anti-Black racism is the range of possibilities of what you can do to Black bodies. It is a kind of racism born from, engendered by, the violences that cohere from the psychic life of slavery. If you are curious about what happens to our flesh, our bodies, I want to point you toward a passage in Hortense Spiller's 1987 essay, Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, an American grammar book, arguably one of the most pivotal essays in Black global thought. And she writes, eyes beaten out, arms, backs, skulls branded, a left jaw, a right ankle punctured, teeth missing as the calculated work of iron, whips, chains, knives, the canine patrol, the bullet. That can be found in her book, um, um, Black and White and in Color. The range of violent possibilities that open us is legion. But I will focus on three of the most lethal, at least from the perspective of what it means to live and work in the great state of North Carolina. One of those possibilities is to kill us directly and swiftly. The second possibility kills us softly. It engages us in a series of conversations about how it feels to be colored me and all my literary folks out there will note the reference to Zora Neale Hurston. And then stretch those conversations over centuries. The third performs a kind of confusion about what African descended people want allowing those in power to set the terms for how they will recognize our right to have something that they have no right to give in the first place. We therefore live under a profound and enduring contradiction. So that's my critical race theorist, uh, critical ethnic studies approach to anti-black racism in particular. Uh, I can continue or I'd like to just maybe leave it there and then have other colleagues join in, Kia, if that's okay. Sure, thank you, Sharon. That was, I think, a really important way to start. Um, would anyone else like to add their thoughts on how you define anti-Black racism or what frameworks um, and literature you use to define it or think about it? Yeah, Kia, I'd be happy to jump in here. Uh, thinking is, I'm thinking historically, the most anti-Black racist thing that's ever happened in the history of this continent is the institution of slavery and perhaps even the formation of the Confederate States of America. So anytime that you venerate that, you are celebrating people who were actively anti-Black to a level where they were willing to conduct a war against the United States of America. And as regretful as that history may be, it's also anti-Black to then support and affirm that history, right, those ideas by trying to maintain a Confederate monument by spending hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, offering a $2.5 million settlement to a neo-Confederate white nationalist group who would restore the Confederacy if given the chance. Thank God that was overturned in court. 
using police to harass and assault um, anti-black or anti-racist black student protesters, um, refusing to acknowledge the burial or the cemetery of African Americans who worked at the university, and um, allowing any sort of neo-Confederate white nationalist group to demonstrate on campus, potentially even with guns, in order to threaten students and therefore give them a platform to promote their anti-black racist views. I mean, all of those things are things that I've seen with my own two eyes in the last few years at the university. So as opposed to trying to always make progress, we are sort of spinning our wheels because we lack a clear moral vision of what is actually appropriate and what needs to be said and supported in terms of anti-racist activity. We've in fact contributed to organizations that want to literally take us backward. And so as troubling as the history is 150 years from now, the, the way that we've given oxygen and wind to that movement has just been stunningly demoralizing lately on this campus. Thank you, William. Um, Heidi or, or Mark? I think I would like to add to that the, the racism of passivity and the willingness to just look away from the systemic and structural dehumanization and destruction of Black lives. Uh, and that means that seemingly neutral, very seductive beliefs like meritocracy and the American dream, um, which, uh, you know, from, from my point of view as a scholar anchored in Asian American studies are also so fundamental to the way that other racial groups are positioned vis-a-vis uh, -vis white supremacy. Um, but all of these neutral beliefs, uh, as well as, you know, intersectional issues such as transphobia or gay bashing or sexism, um, they all are rooted in the idea that a lack of success or advancement is the individual's fault. And so just that willingness to, to believe blindly in meritocracy, in this principle of uplift, which has been so fundamental to the US's conception of itself as this welcoming nation um, is, is at its heart fundamentally anti-Black. And I think that importantly, that conversation is starting to come out more and more. So I'll, uh, I'll amplify what um, Heidi was talking about and just continue that because one thing that I see um, from my perspective is um, a kind of insidious form of anti-Black racism that is, that is not explicitly racist. Um, in the sense, I don't hear people using the N-word or, or it's saying very explicitly um, <clears throat> you know, racist things. Instead, it's what I would call a kind of plausibly deniable racism um, and a kind of gaslighting racism um, on a kind of epic scale that is, as I would say, as uh, well, I don't want to compare it, but it's insidious. And it's something that is uh, that we have to attend to in addition to the kind of outrageous um, and explicit forms of racism uh, that we see. So I'll give a couple quick uh, examples. So um, gatekeeping policies that don't specify race, but effectively limit the uh, full participation of black people in this university. Um, simple passivity, as, as Heidi mentioned, and coded language. So um, I think Heidi touched on that when she mentioned meritocracy. So a couple of examples, I've heard people in um, uh, search committees say, I just want to hire the best person for the job without explaining what that means. Or we need someone with more gravitas um, without explaining what gravitas means. Or discussing the pedigree of um, an applicant. And I've also heard that when it comes to uh, grad students. So the thing is, um, these, I call them plausibly deniable because no one's saying we don't want um, a black professor or a black student, but that's effectively what happens. And so, um, you know, I'll, I'll just say something very uh, kind of provocative about my own department, which is that uh, we've been awarding um, PhD since 1939. And guess when we awarded our first PhD to a black student? Never. Um, so we haven't done that yet. Um, so, and it's not at least in the third, in the, uh, sorry, the uh, 14 years I've been here, it's not specifically because I've ever heard 
someone say we don't want black students there's no sign outside our department that says uh, you know no blacks allowed but in fact our passivity and our lack of taking action has had the same impact now to be fair to my department we've been working really hard over the last few years to change that but that would be the point is that we have to actually do hard work and not just um, accept the status quo because doing that effectively um, promotes anti-black racism thank you all so much i think something that has stood out to me in what you all have said which is very profound is that there's a whole range of forms of anti-blackness it's not one thing right um and so i think that that is essential and even as we think about racism there are racisms so it's a plural complex you know kind of um combination of practices and ideologies and you know and these things change over time right um, so Mark, your comment about the music department, and that's just one example, but it's also an example that highlights how we're still having firsts in 2020 or maybe in 2030, right? Uh, and, and sort of making an analogy to driving, you, if you stay in neutral, you don't go anywhere, right? Downhill, if anything, <laughs> right? If you're on a hill, probably. Um, but uh, Sharon and I both attended the same undergraduate institution, Princeton, and uh, there was some celebration about the fact that they would have their first African American, or they did have their first African American valedictorian in that institution's 247 year history, I believe, right? However, he could not speak due to the COVID <laughs> pandemic, right? So that was also bittersweet. And we have to think about how deeply entrenched I think these practices are, anti Black practices, right? Sharon, did you want to add anything um, to what has been said, um, thinking about intersectionality as well? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that all the work that I do is informed intersectionally, right? Um, and, but I was thinking in particular about what, how embodiment works institutionally in particular, you know, in particular. And I think one of the questions here is how is anti-black racism manifested in university context, which is part of the group of questions you've asked us to consider for this first part. And I think the most profound and misunderstanding that manifests itself um, in academic institutions is that people assume by the look of me, right, that my only concern will be with black issues, right? They consume by the look of me that I don't have um, intellectual work that moves across several fields, right? And they assume that this, because they look at me and they make a one-to-one -one correlation with the work between, with myself and between me and the work that I do, they basically understand that my work is born solely out of my experience, right? But not rigorous intellectual work. And when I say rigorous intellectual work, I mean, yes, reading across multiple fields to understand anti-Black racism, to understand forms of racism. Um, this reading has brought change in my own heart and mind, right? But I also think it puts pressure on what are, and this is something that um, 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 William talked about in terms of the moral compass, you know, it puts pressure on our ethical commitments. What should they be? What must they be? Um, I think one of the things that white colleagues and administrators sometimes do is they believe that black feeling is easily accessible to them. And they substitute witnessing that feeling for the actual work needed to attend to the multiple issues before us. Um, and other forms of institutional violence um, to dismiss pointed critiques of intersexual violence, um, racism, sexism, homophobia, by doing what I call leveling up. You bring something to a meeting, right? A particular concern that's specific that involves persons who produce actions. And what happens in that leveling up process, all of a sudden you're in the all of humanity realm. That's just human being. People are just like that. And so I think we need to move away from human beings long list of negative attributes. And as a practitioner of animal studies, I can give you several <laughs> that I've learned over the course of the last five years. Um, and 
I have other things to say about intersectionality in particular, but I, I want to hear from my other um, um, colleagues on the dais today. I mean, I think that that's a really good segue. So I will uh, introduce the next question. Uh, maybe uh, William or Heidi can uh, start us off with a response. But I think all of us have heard the quote, it is not enough to be non-racist, we must be anti-racist, right? So I think uh, I have heard that increasingly um, more and more every day. Um, so thinking about what does that mean? Uh, what are strategies for being anti-racist? Uh, we can think about this more broadly, but we can also think about it within university and organizational context as well. I think you might just want to call on someone. William. <laughs> Look, I think one of the things that white people need to do to work on this whole anti-racism thing, and I really do believe in that term now, but look, my God, just consider things every now and again from a black perspective. And I know that's very, very difficult for many of our, our white leaders to do. But I mean, you know, sometimes the answer is actually very clear. You know, we, we oftentimes think about things, our leaders seem to white ethno. William, we lost you for a minute there. You may want to repeat your last couple of sentences. Okay, sorry about that. Thank you. I just think that one of the things that we do is we prioritize the perspectives of older white donors. It seems as if so many of our administrative decisions are not guided by the people that you see on the screen. It's guided by, well, is you know Tim and Wendy going to leave us a grand in their will that we might get in 25 years? And I think that we need to really start to think about development in different ways. People aren't always just going to support conservative causes, I don't think, or potentially white perspectives, especially if you communicate with them what other perspectives look like. And some of these answers are very, are very simple. You know, like, it's so bizarre to have a building named for a member of the Ku Klux Klan in the year 2020. And, I mean, we can't get past that. Like, it's nuts, right? I mean, if we could consider maybe – okay, let's think about different perspectives here and what is the most egregious for a black person to live, you know, work across the parking lot from a building named after a Klansman. It's just incredible. You know, white donors, you know, be damned, whatever, you know, communicate the importance of that to them. But I mean, I do think that we fundamentally prioritize one perspective and it's often an imagined perspective, quite frankly, and we let our decisions um, be filtered through that simple perspective. And, I think to be more actively non-racist, you know, we need to consider broader perspectives and not just sort of tout out the language of inclusion all of the time. You know, it always seems like it's some sort of a marketing pamphlet and then it doesn't actually affect our decisions. I think uh, to add to what William said, there's this unwillingness to look, to really scrutinize the systems by which we operate. So take something like gatekeeping, right? And admissions, which Mark has already so powerfully illustrated for us. Look at the difference that was made in UNC's School of Nursing when leaders like Rume Alexander worked to get rid of the standardized test requirements. And I actually hope that what's happening around the country and even the world um, with standardized tests being temporarily thrown out uh, because of the COVID epidemic can actually lead to a reconsideration of practices like that, that we know are rooted in these uh, structural inequities of access, right, um, of, of all of these um, psychological weights that people of different races bring to bear on these kinds of gatekeeping experiences, right, these tests um, that we know are, are built for certain people to fail. Um, and I think that, you know, putting putting those kinds of systems to the side, it, it takes a willingness to walk away from our conventional comfortable standards by which we judge these things, right? It's, it's back to that problem of the meritocracy. Um, and it requires substituting hard work and judgment for those simple cuts that you can make with those kinds of standards.
I wanted to add to, um, you know, to what William was saying earlier in particular about donors and about the climate on campus. And I feel that the negative responses that we get as black faculty in particular, when we try to advocate for ourselves and for our communities on campus are cloaked in a kind of anonymity. We're all required to come forward to, to have our names listed as documented persons who are part of whatever equity strategies we have going on campus. We're in this public webinar, right? So people know exactly how we feel about these issues. But the folks who want us to remove the word white, right, from university-sponsored posts about anti-racist work get to be anonymous. And I think it's time for the university and for the administration to encourage those people and make them be public facing. Because you cannot have a discussion when a whole swath of individuals who, who call into the chancellor's office remain unnamed, unseen, unknown to us. Thank you. I think we might be moving on to our next question. Um, instead of questions which are on white privilege. So for our panelists, um, and, and I will ask a couple of people to start responding to this one, but how might a focus on white privilege be important in our current anti-racist work? And in this moment in which people are talking so much more about white privilege, different forms of white supremacy, white fragility, um, Mark or William, would you like to get us started with that question? Please go ahead, Mark. I'll give you the privilege of answering first. Thank you. Thank you. It's, <clears throat> speaking of white privilege. Um, so uh, I think it's a, it's a great question about why, <clears throat> why we should um, you know, focus on <clears throat> white privilege and white supremacy. I mean, one is the simple reason is that focusing on white privilege and white supremacy is appropriate because it's white people who created systemic racism. So we need to center, we need to center that. Um, and there are some, some ways we could do this and kind of remind ourselves this is not, this is a problem that white people created and need to, need to be at the uh, center of solving. Um, and there are some ways I think we just need to reframe the way we think of, of these issues. So when, when um, white people talk about uh, resisting say quotas or talking about affirmative action, as unfair, um, I think we can point out that our country was, was in fact founded on white male privilege and that affirmative action for white men has been the norm for centuries. I mean, I have lots of examples. I know um, professors of mine who um, in the 60s, uh, their uh, white male professor, their white male advisor called their white male friend at another university and said, give my student a job and they got jobs. Um, I mean, that's just, that has been the norm. So we need to realize that, the, that a lot of the things that white people uh, feel uncomfortable about when it, it's the seeming unfairness of, of affirmative action or of quotas is to point out that that's been the norm for white people for hundreds of years. Um, another thing is just uh, within our disciplines, uh, since we're at a university, is to, uh, is to point out that when, what we often characterize as foundational knowledge in our disciplines is, offering, is often centering the experience of white men and is not universal. So in music, um, we talk about the canon being um, you know, Beethoven, Bach, Brahms, and so on. These are all white European men, but we often speak of them in, as universal. Um, I know uh, my friends in dance um, talk about the problematic nature of, of centering ballet as foundational. So a lot of it is just how, what we center and how we, how we think of, of uh, whiteness, the, kind of the position of whiteness in this, um, in this uh, situation of systemic racism. I think about it in, in sort of two different ways. Of course, one is the commemorative landscape on our campus. I'm a historian. I'd like to speak to that. But first and foremost, you know, it's interesting with these conversations about affirmative action and responses to them. Look, 
I knew for a fact that our next chancellor after Carol Fort was going to be a white male. I knew for a fact that our next UNC system president was going to be a white male. I never had any doubt in my mind whatsoever who those people were going to look like. I don't have any reason to believe that we're going to have an African-American chair of the history department. That seems unfathomable to me. There are no black deans in my unit. So, I mean, it's, it's, it, it is interesting with some of these conversations about affirmative action and stuff that, you know, oh my Lord, these people of color have all the leg up. But I know that after we have, a, you know, a, a female dean or, you know, a person of color that the next person coming down the pipeline, I know exactly what they're going to look like. And I can't help but think that that reflects affirmative action. The other thing too is that, look, I'm a diversity hire. And I think oftentimes people think of diversity hires as being the lucky ones who got to get this job, right? I mean, otherwise, you know, who knows where you'd be working. But we're thinking of it the wrong way when we think of it like that. It's not for me, it's benefited me in my career, absolutely. It's for the campus. And I think that some of us who are here work with a great sense of purpose because we understand that we owe that. We owe our positions, we owe our intellectual energy to the people who help make this space for us. And then also the people who might go through their entire college career and they might only see one person that looks like you. And I think that's really important. And then quite frankly, to, to harp again on our commemorative landscape, you know, white privilege is working on a campus with 300 buildings and only two of them are named for people of color, you know? And those are just sort of far away after, you know, afterthoughts. That it's more important to privilege the history of white people at UNC than it is to include all of us. We know black people have always been present, but that makes some white folks uncomfortable to have those conversations. And so we just sort of shut them down. and We don't remember their contributions. We build them a little tiny table, you know, and then try and move on um, without actually addressing the history of UNC's role in racism in this country. Thank you, William. Um, were there any other um, thoughts that panelists wanted to share before I move on to another kind of sub-question related to this? Okay. So for all of our panelists, can you please give examples of challenging white privilege from your work or life? especially in university contexts, but also beyond. And we definitely have had some university-based examples, but we, I think, also realize this is an everyday <laughs> phenomenon. We don't, especially right now, live our lives only at the university. So how does this also play out in various spheres of our lives? I'll take a swing at that one based on something that happened recently. So uh, I'm a parent now and, you know, my Facebook feed is mostly either academic or parenting groups. And um, in one of the parenting groups I'm in, uh, during the height of the recent protests, um, there was this big thread going um, and the, the group is mostly white. Um, and it was this, you know, put your anti-racism uh, book suggestions here. What are good diverse children's books? Uh, you know, uh, what kind of anti-racism parenting kits do you have? And it was a huge thread, a lot of chatter. And I looked at it, it gave me some hope. You know, I thought, wow, like, could, could there really be some change in this next generation? Six days later, uh, a, a parent came on and said, oh, I have this child who's a really... Um, precocious reader, and um, I don't really know what books are appropriate. Uh, anyone have suggestions? Bam, right back to the status quo. Like as if the other thread had never existed. Six days, that's all it took for people to forget to do that deliberate work. And so, as my friends know, many of you on this panel know, I don't post a lot on social media, and so it takes a real effort for me to kind of you know, go against my inclinations and do that. But I had to intervene because I just thought we can't go back to that. But you know, that's labor, that's emotional labor that comes with the risk of being attacked. That's what it's like all the time. That's what the work is like. And you know, it happens when you're just trying to see like what farm is open that you can take your kid to, uh, you know, right now when nothing is open. It just, it comes at you at, at unexpected times. And you just, you always have to, um, be out there doing that work. Thank you, Heidi. Would anyone else like to add to 
examples of challenging white privilege? I just want to offer just one very, very quick one, Kia, if you don't mind. You know, sometimes I think the, that privilege can be overused, whatever. But one thing that's very clear to me is the silence. And so when things are happening that are hard about race and white folks are like, well, I don't want to offend this person or that person, so I'm just going to not say anything. Well, then it, the work comes back down to us. Because when we're standing in front of our students and they are in tears sometimes, and they don't know. They're, you know, that's why they're here to become equipped to deal with this complex world. We can't be silent. But you know, so when when the Chronicle of Higher Education calls South Building and says, "What's happening with your Confederate monument in South Building?" Nobody says a peep. Guess who they call? They call us. And therefore, that makes more work for us. And I think a lot of people during these challenging times, when things are coming up and they're political. They think, you know, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut, and that's just the easiest thing for me. That makes our lives and our work harder. So to be an ally and to think about privilege, I think, is to think about speaking up, even when it's uncomfortable for you to do so. So I'll, um, I'll give an example of, of what uh, William was just talking about um, that, I, that really helped me as a white person see that uh, the extent or even a kind of hint of the extent of that labor. I was on a committee um, not at the university, but as a professional um, organization. And there was a situation that was kind of uh, uh, concerning about, um, about kind of uh, tokenizing uh, some African-American uh, members. And um, I felt kind of uncomfortable about mentioning it, but I decided in this board meeting to mention it. And uh, it took me some effort to do it, but I, what really struck me was uh, the one black person on this committee looked over at me after I said this and mouthed the words, thank you. And, and it just hit me that how tired he must be all the time of being the person who brings this up. And, um, and just to see the relief on his face of not having to be that person yet again. And all I did was do this one little thing. So it just gave me a sense of, of just the, the vast amount of, of energy that is depleted and the labor that's demanded of, of uh, many of my colleagues um, and what, what I as a white person can do um, to do that labor as, uh, as William suggested. Mark, I think you bring up a really good point, and you know that moves us to the next question about uh, we talk a lot about being an ally. What is allyship? And you know, there are various ways that people have talked about being an ally um, in these moments. But I wanted to pose the question, maybe starting uh, with Sharon, around uh, how do we define being an ally? Um, what is allyship? What does it mean, uh, both in terms of words, but also in terms of action? Um, yeah, I looked at that question and, you know, it gave me pause, right? Because so many people think that allyship and all of you are going to recognize my dogs are barking. I can't get them to stop barking. So um, you'll hear them in the background, but they're in another room. Um, you know, so many people say, well, you know, allyship are forms of sentimental connection. But those forms of sentimental connection usually occur after a really horrific event. I cannot tell you how many times when I've been present at a meeting when something is said and it's, it's, it's really traumatizing for almost everyone in the meeting, right? Because one of the things we don't, we misunderstand about racism that it affects, it affects us all, right? And particularly anti-black racism affects African descended peoples. But the worst thing that can happen to you is to be in that meeting and to go out of that meeting and have a white colleague touch you, squeeze your shoulder, squeeze your arm, like, ooh, I'm sorry that happened to you. That's not actually allyship, that's violence, plain and simple. And another form of violence I want to add um, occurs with the phrase that I keep um, seeing repeated. And, you know, I've been involved with, my family's been involved with Carolina since 1961, well, 1959, so I know about the Carolina way. And part of that Carolina way is the phrase, to serve the great state of North Carolina. And um, I always think about service in particular, because I'm going to 
relay something that happened to me on the Eastern shore when I was moving furniture from my, the, the beach place we have. And uh, it was about a three hour trip. I was loading furniture in and a gentleman across the street who, you know, the first time when I saw him, I thought he looks like Santa Claus. He has you know, white hair, white Santa Claus figure with the white beard. And he said, um, he hailed me and he said, so, you know, you almost done. And I said, no, I got about another hour. And the next question out of his mouth was, how many houses do you clean? So when we serve the great state of North Carolina, these ideas, these, the psychic life of, of slavery, the psychic life of racism are always embedded in those encounters. So what I, I bring up those two examples because the, the latter is an example of white allyship. This gentleman thought he was making a connection with me. The person who touches me thinks that they are making a connection with me. And no matter how many centuries of philosophical thought and black global, global discourse and revolutionary thought pass, people still haven't learned, don't do that, stop. And one of the things I've learned in my work in um, um, animal studies discourse is to let beings come to you. Don't make any assumptions about what you think you know. Why don't you actually let the being come to you and you will find out everything that you need to know. So I feel like somewhere in there are the workings of an allyship that might matter against an allyship that actually shows up as violence in everyday life. Heidi, do you want to go next? Um, I think, let me start from a negative place of saying what allyship is not in, in the spirit of, of Sharon's anecdote. You know, allyship is not patronage. It is not colorblindness. And it does not negate or smooth out your own privilege. And I think that a really important thing uh, to remember about allyship is that you wake up every day and it's a conscious choice you have to make, right? And it is a conscious set of actions that you take intentionally and in partnership. And you have that privilege to get up and make that choice every day. And, you know, you're going you're gonna to make mistakes. You're going to be plagued with self-doubt. You're going to apologize. You're going to fail better. Um, but that is your privilege to get up to make those choices and to try um, to, to take on this mantle. I won't call it an identity because you can put it on and off, right? Um, and I think that that is maybe the most um, important thing because when you, when you sit in a kind of place of complacency about allyship, then I think that's where you end up um, where, where Sharon described, right? do the work and you're just so comfortable in that identity that you think that, you know, you can just reach out to this person after this meeting, um, like you have some kind of shared experience, um, but you don't. And that doesn't mean that, you know, you're not gonna swat every fly. Like I said, you're gonna make mistakes. Um, you're not gonna speak up every time. You're not gonna find the words every time. Um, but I think, Remembering that allyship is a privilege is something that can help keep you working um, and keep you humble also. Thank you. I think we'll ask the next part of this um, question, which is how can white people be allies without taking up too much space or dominating the narrative? And then I also want to throw in a question about how allyship looks differently for white allies and allies who are non-Black um, or indigenous people or other people of color. Um, so I do think it's important for us not only to think about white, black racial dynamics, but even going back to anti-blackness, there's anti-blackness found throughout most communities in this country, not just white folks. And it's also found within the black community, to be honest, right? Um, and, and it takes different forms in different communities. Um, so, just to go back to the question, how can white people be allies without taking up too much space or dominating the narrative? And then also, can we think about non-white allies and what is the role of non-white allies in 
um, this anti-racist struggle that we're talking about. I have an idea about that, Kia. Um, I think one of the things that's important, if you are going to be an ally, your allyship should not necessarily require a response or comment or any sort of work at all from the person that you are trying to serve as an ally to. So for example, um, and again, people are sharing stories from, from here, but you know, I, I had a colleague who, who posted something in defense of a white supremacist in an op-ed that was very public, and I responded to that person in the op-ed, and then he attacked me in this other way, whatever. And you know, I probably got 60 emails from people saying, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that, blah, 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 blah. All of those email all of those emails sort of required a response from me. So, you know, then I write, you know, 60 emails like, thanks, I, I appreciate that. The one person who was my greatest ally on the faculty took me out to lunch, you know, to talk about it. But the person who publicly was the greatest ally was the person who didn't write me an email, but that wrote their own response in an op-ed, right? Um, arguing against that person's op-ed, you know, supporting this white supremacist. And that person was an undergraduate student. He did more to serve as an ally at that very moment than any of my colleagues, even though he didn't even have a BA, right? It, but it didn't require anything of me, but it was to defend me without having any sort of, you know, it was very proper, but it was, you know, without having to require anything further of me. And I think, you know, that's just sort of one sort of extreme public example, I thought. But one thing that you can also do is in meetings when the person being discussed, the person of color being discussed, or the anti-racist activist being discussed is, you need to make sure that you defend them even when they don't even know it's coming or when they don't even know it's working. We all know how salaries and promotions and appointments happen here many times behind closed doors. You need to speak up in those meetings, even though that person can't see you demonstrating your allyship. It's got to always be there. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll follow up. Uh, one thing that uh, Sharon said that really struck me was the anecdote about the <clears throat> Uh, the person who uh, asked about how many uh, houses she had left to clean. And um, we talk a lot about empathy and about the need for empathy. But what Sharon pointed out is that this person had what he thought was an empathetic response to, uh, to Sharon's situation, but in fact, it did violence uh, to her. So, um, so I just want to make the quick point that empathy can be important, but it's, I would say, it's, it's certainly not sufficient and can even, um, as uh, William suggested, be also be a burden. So be really, you know, thoughtful about this empathy. There are lots of, I'm sure, empathetic white people who are agonizing about the situation, but aren't actually um, actively contributing to, um, you know, to addressing anti-Black uh, racism or and are perhaps burdening um, others with, with, their, with their empathy. So, um, you know, one thing that, that I want to uh, just pivot to is to talk about white people working on themselves, um, whether it's first or in tandem with, with addressing uh, the world. But this is, this is my suggestion, and uh, it's uh, to work on yourself. So I have two broad thoughts. First, uh, develop a self-awareness about your actions and your privilege and where and how you hold space and power. And do that just with yourself and do it without pitying yourself or being defensive. And then second, work towards sharing and relinquishing power. So um, I'm actually writing an article. Um, it's, uh, in a sense, uh, a how-to guide um, or suggestions for white men about giving up power. Um, and um, so I've been thinking about this. So I'll just throw out a couple of suggestions. One is taking an inventory of your power. So where are you taking up space? Where are you, uh, what positions of power either formally or informally do you have? Um, recommend others. So when you get opportunities and when you get asked uh, to do something, instead of necessarily accepting that right away, think about who you might recommend who is not a white man or white person generally. Um, quit things. Um, I did this too after my inventory of, of uh, my positions of power. I realized I was on three editorial boards for journals in which there were few, if any, uh, black people, people of color, and indigenous people. 
And I quit three, I quit them and asked each one to consider replacing me with someone who wasn't a white man. Um, another thing is to, is to develop and cultivate successors. So I don't necessarily suggest that all white men should just quit what they're doing right now. And um, because that's actually not necessarily a responsible or helpful thing to do. But what all white men in power can do is to think about who could succeed them, who could replace them and make sure that, that people who aren't white men have the tools, the qualifications, the uh, access to power that, that they would need to succeed you. And then finally, I would say, um, support people behind the scenes. So continued support. So in the end, you know, I would say it's really about doing work on yourself and, and doing work to, um, to share power and relinquish power. Thank you. So that actually is close, similar to our next question. And we've talked a, a lot about it within the university context. And I think this question is rooted in both the UNC uh, campus community, local community, but also abroad is that what are structural changes that are needed in university and our broader organizational context to continue challenging um, anti-racism. So what are the things that we need to see, right? Not just individual action, but what are the things that need to happen to challenge systems of inequity that exist? Maybe start with Sharon and then Heidi and anyone else who would like to chime in. Sure, I think the first thing we have to do is recognize that those challenges to systems of inequity require huge and extraordinary amounts of physical and psychic labor for black faculty, indigenous faculty, and people of color on this campus. And um, one of those, one of those uh, I, want to, I want to mention that you know, about a year ago, we, through another political action with a list of demands, we established a critical ethnic studies collective and that's just one of the ways in which institutionally we can begin to build right um, understandings about intersectional life and this is the return to that intersectionality um, one of the things that um, ces does and i'll just point a little bit toward uh, the work that we're doing um, is let me see is the syllabus, the CB, CES syllabus takes you through the reimaginings of the archive and its retrieval. It journeys through what settler colonialism actually is. It's not an event, but a process, present and ongoing. Some people tend to flatten what's happen, what happens to indigenous, black, and POC peoples um, to, to our histories, as opposed to saying, you know, and then that way it allows them to say, oh, we've gotten over that. We're no longer doing that, right? Critical ethnic studies allows us to see that these processes of deterritorialization, right, these processes of our incarceration um, are always already ongoing. It also understands the key intellectual debates in black global thought um, from black pessimism to other um, paradigmatic contextual contextualizations. Um, and it weaves in um, as foundational um, sexuality and the work from LGBTQ um, AI scholars um, and activists. And so I think when we have an intellectual discourse on the campus that takes seriously the intellectual work of scholars across a broad spectrum of belonging, then we also begin to understand that what it is that we're doing when we investigate black community, but we investigate that community without understanding its intellectual thought or even its history, then we do a disservice not only to the work we create, but um, the people that we are supposed to represent. Well, I've been meditating on this question a lot, um, Shauna, as, as many people have, and um, you know, I've, as you would expect, I've worked my way back through a lot of scholarship to help me process it. And I, I started from a place of real doubt about my own work and whether all of the incremental changes I've tried to make are really, you know, worth it in a sense. Um, and are they really the way to go? 
Um, and I think this is a moment of reckoning. What, uh, this is a moment to really call for bold change and bold reforms. And, um, you know, I was, I was thinking about, I know this quote gets uh, loosely applied a lot, but I was really considering what Audre Lorde famously said, you know, can we ever dismantle the master's house with the master's tools? And specifically for my own discipline, I was thinking about Ngugi Wationgo's call to abolish all English departments, um, which he called for in 1972, right? Um, because of their, their place as um, not just institutions of white supremacy, uh, but as institutions of colonialist and imperialist thought. But I was, uh, you know, clearly I worked myself to a very dark place. and. Um, I went back and I reread uh, a scholar named Wayne Yang who writes under the name La Paperson. Um, and he wrote a, a short piece called A Third University is Possible. And, and he reminds us that the university is an institution that must be refused, but that it's also an assemblage of machines that we can use to do decolonizing work, like the work that Sharon is doing with CES. But it has to be bold, it has to be purposeful, and it has to be outward facing. Uh, it, has to, it has to partner with the communities to really, again, attack the roots of these systemic racisms. And I know that community work is something that this university and many other universities uh, really pride themselves on. Um, but to really foreground it, put the resources behind it, and really attack these programs uh, with, with broad institutional change. I think this is the moment for that. And I've been, you know, as someone who, who has, you know, kind of plodded along working for um, incremental change, I think this, this is a moment for different tactics. Mark or William, or maybe move on to the next question or the q and It looks like we have about 30 yeah. minutes. Yeah, I'd like to jump in just with one point. You know, every single statement that departments release should be accompanied by resources, okay? W one of the things that we could do, every department, if you issued a silent SAM statement or if you issued a police brutality statement, then offer faculty or graduate students additional resources in order to help them support that actual work and also to recognize that actual work. Some of us have talked about this at the university level, the only university level award that does not come with a monetary stipend is the diversity award. If you do the most to help advocate diversity on this campus, be it as a staff member, a student, faculty, whatever, that's the one major award you can win that doesn't come with a nickel. And so, you know, you could talk about how happy you are to celebrate Juneteenth so you're blue in the face, but until there are some actual resources behind these statements, there's no reason for people to really believe in them. Our chancellor tweeted out, you know, something about Juneteenth a few days ago. That's wonderful. We in the last five years have not been approved to hire a historian of American slavery. Stop with the Juneteenth comments and give us the resources that allow us to help hire people that can help push our society behind these lingering, beyond these lingering conflicts. Mark, do you have something to add? Uh, not specifically to this, I'm happy to go to Q&A, but I will just point out that um, uh, I don't think we got to the question about how um, other allies other than white people could address um, uh, anti-black racism, in case you wanted to get back to that. Why are you all looking at me? <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll just quickly say that, you know, I think actually increasingly um, there is ground that uh, white allies and um, non-black uh, POCs share in this, which is that um, there's just so much need to educate our communities about how these systems oppress us all, right, in the spirit of, um, you know, until all of us are free, none of us are free. Um, and there's, there's tremendous diversity within these communities, obviously, politically, in terms of immigration status. Um, and it makes the work very challenging. Uh, there's, there's need for a lot of public education work. And I think that also um, it creates this false sense of divided loyalties. Uh, as, as a 
1960s Chinese American activist friend of mine recently reminded me, it's one battle with many fronts, but you have to convince people of that, right? Um, and what it means on an individual level is that sometimes you're running from webinar to webinar, right? You do, I do this and then I go talk about how people are racist against Asian people. Uh, but it's important to put uh, those conversations together. And I think that an important thing for people to remember, especially anyone watching who's kind of new to this journey, is that you are perceived differently, I think, as a, a non-white um, ally who's a person of color or uh, is indigenous because um, people will bring their own preconceptions to you that may make your, your work harder at the beginning or less effective, right? With Asian Americans specifically, there's this perception that we have no skin in the game because we're not underrepresented in higher education. But likewise, there's this absolutely correct perception that we've benefited from the model, model minority stereotype, which has placed us as a weapon of anti-blackness. And so, um, you know, from, from administrators, you might get this attitude of like, why, why are you doing this to yourself, right? I don't see you as a person of color. That sentence, people say that sentence, right? Um, or likewise, I think that, you know, as you're trying to be an ally, as you're trying to act mindfully, um, there can also be a kind of skepticism uh, towards you. And you, you have to get past your own feelings about that, I think, um, and recognize that, you know, being an ally, just because you want to be an ally, it doesn't mean that your individual intentions can overcome uh, immediately these barriers that have been set between us for so long, these iron cages, as the historian Ronald Takaki called it, um, that white supremacy has put us in. So there are, there are challenges, there's, there's no doubt, um, but I think that uh, we are, it is essential for us to work together. And, you know, the spirit that Sharon talked about in critical ethnic studies um, of having that shared understanding of how all of these processes have worked together um, is crucial. Thank you. I think we're going to move on to our questions from the audience and attendees. Um, so thank you for your patience. Thank you for submitting questions on YouTube and also through the Q&A feature on Zoom. Um, please continue to do that and we'll get to as many of them as we can. We also had some uh, questions that were submitted by people who registered for the webinar ahead of time. Um, so I'm going to start with something that piggybacks on Heidi's comments just now, um, but it's open to all of the panel, the full panel. So the question is, could you share with the attendees what you would be doing if you were not preparing for or attending this session? What compels you to do this work instead of those activities? Um, and there also was a related question of, is this quote unquote service? Uh, so I'd love to open this up to the panel because uh, this is unpaid labor in the summer and it is labor, so. Anyone who'd like to, to address that? I'd be finishing my book on human animal blackness and working on actually the rest of Zambrana's work on um, toxic ivory towers and formulating, folding that into um, the strategies of diversity work on campus that actually work on a model I'm borrowing from animal studies of scarcity. So thank you for asking about my intellectual work that I would be doing instead of serving the great state of North Carolina right now. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be working on a book too. Um, I think one thing that people can do to connect this in allyship though is that look, make the argument, offer incentives for anti-racist service. And then also when you're in closed door committees with a salary or promotion and tenure committee, you need to argue on behalf of people that things like this should actually count as service just as much as publishing a journal article, or sorry, um, editing some sort of a, a, a journal or being an assistant editor or something like that or whatever that might be. I mean, just recognize that this is service as well. I think that's really important. Yeah, I don't see how this is not service. I see we've got 412 participants and more on YouTube. Um, I don't you know, it, it boggles the mind how people could not consider this to be service. 
but if I weren't doing this, I'd be finishing up an article on um, William Faulkner and Edna Ferber, uh, which kind of speaks to what Sharon was saying earlier about, you know, people. Uh, I Part of the reason I keep doing that work is not just because I like those books, um, but because it, it feels like a political imperative uh, to me to say that, you know, people of color have fresh perspectives and important things to say about the canon, about these authors. Mark, did you want to respond to that question as well? Um, well, I have a book that I was uh, supposed to turn in, I believe in 2014. Um, so that's something I should be working on. But, um, but actually just to flip this a little bit, I think it's, it's a different question for white people because um, while it, this work that I'm doing right now does in a sense, take away from other work. Um, this is actually work that I should be doing, and I will probably get credit for it um, as being the white guy in the panel. Um, you know, there's a very low bar for us. Um, I just have to like step over it, and you know, huzzah! Um, you know, I'm this uh, white ally. So, um, so there's a, a sense of, of inequity there too. That. Um, uh, you know, about uh, rewards. But actually, the, the more positive thing I want to say is that in thinking about uh, this article that I'm writing about giving up power, actually what I want to convince people is how meaningful and how rewarding that is. Um, so there is a reward to doing this work. It's not just give up power because you've uh, benefited unfairly from white supremacy. It's do this for you too. So that's something that I would I would say to um, to other other white people about about this work about um, that uh, taking on this uh, what is a burden so much to um, to other people can be incredibly um, powerful for us. So um, I think there is incentive for white people to be allies if it's done right, of course. So I'm going to flip to one of our questions that were submitted over the course of our discussion. And this is uh, merging together a lot of what we've talked about thus far. But one of our questions is centered around what are the ways that we can um, promote or amplify student voice uh, in this process? So whether that be undergraduate students or graduate students, what are some ways that we can allow uh, student voice to um, contribute to these discussions, but also lay the groundwork for our uh, actions. We have to have an anti-racist practice in the classroom and, and outside of it. And I guess what I'm saying here is that we understand, people think that they, that if they say something to support or to be empathetic with their black colleagues in particular, then that's their practice for that day. But, you know, like I tell my students who are writers, you know, if you're not going to go out with a field hockey stick that, and you've never played field hockey onto a field and then all of a sudden become like, you know, the, the biggest goal scorer, then you really need to think about what practice involves. Practice also involves failure. But a lot of times we're so we're so connected to an environment in the classroom where we cannot challenge, where we don't want to upset people, that we don't let them fail at the very thing that they need to fail at again and again as a practice until they get it right. And I'm not saying fail at the expense of POC indigenous and particularly black peoples. So that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is read literature, read something, bring questions forward, from that investigation and test those questions that you have about that text, not about something that's in your head that then interacts with that text, but actually take the words that you're reading in those classes seriously. The problem is, is we don't have an integrated practice approach across the curriculum that brings these questions to students so that they can develop this practice. So I feel we need to do some curricular, serious curricular change in order that people think of these moments as quotidian. Every day, I'm gonna be thinking about and going through all of this intellectual work that's before me. So that's one way. I also think it's very important for us to better protect our students in order to invest in their intellectual um, potential. You know, 
at, at UNC, I've, I've always heard stories that, you know, when Frank Porter Graham was running this place, he would say, you have to go through me to get to my faculty or get to my students. Lately on this campus, it seems like when, you know, neo-Confederate protesters show up, the administration doesn't, you know, take the same stance. In fact, they say, you know what, they're over there, right? And so I think one of the things that we can do is to, we have a real crisis with our police on campus and policing in this society in general. We need more guidance. We need more privacy protections. We don't need to send in under, undercover cops to infiltrate students. We don't need to surveil them constantly. Those are cultural things that need to change. But then also we can offer some more um, intellectual guidance, right, to make sure that people know what the right side of these things are. You know, with all we, we've had such a vacuum the last few years with silence from the top on down, and students have done work to fill that vacuum with very little protection. And in fact, they're often punished for that. I mean, our thinking is so out of place. We need to help empower these people by giving them resources and sometimes physical protection as opposed to just punishing them for speaking out courageously. Thank you. I, um, I want to bring in a question from YouTube um, that was recently posted. How do we respond to non-Black people of color and Black immigrants who do not believe that systemic racism is a barrier for Black people, African Americans, because they themselves have been successful in the U.S.? And then there's also a question about where can you faculty learn about the racial history of UNC? There's a wonderful um, digital humanities pros, uh, uh, disser dissertation that was um, completed by Charlotte Fryer from American Studies, and it goes through the history, a uh, very detailed, in-depth um, history of um, investigations around race um, on campus. And, and actually student activism, faculty involvement, administrative response. I don't have um, that website um, on me right now, but I can certainly um, post it um, for folks to look at later. It's a resource that's on our American Studies page, webpage as well for the department. There's also the UNC Virtual Museum, which I think is going to be redesigned, but the university archivist, Nick Graham, um, is still actively trying to grow it and, and tell um, stories that have been suppressed or overlooked. Um, to the first part of the question, I think, um, you know, without, without knowing uh, the questioner and their background, this, this is a question that comes up a lot, um, particularly, but not exclusively in immigrant communities. And it is just a process. Um, you know, I think that there's, there's this debate over, you know, is it better to argue with your racist uncle or um, put that time into marching in the streets or doing other activist work? Um, and, you know, those aren't, those aren't necessarily uh, clear cut choices that you have to make. Um, but at the same time, I think it is helpful to remember that there are, there are outlets uh, other than arguing with your racist uncle. Um, and I think that, you know, very often what I've seen in my advocacy work is that a lot of that journey happens as people um, have children or younger relatives who grow up in the U.S. Um, who sort of experience the processes of racialization um, because, you know, people who uh, immigrate may not fully understand. And I've watched my parents go on their own journey about this, um, but they don't fully understand right, where they are positioned in terms of the system. Um, they have practical concerns, you know, that are not to be taken lightly. And so fortunately now there are more community organizations like the one I work with um, that are doing this kind of educational work. And I think that um, that has been a real, uh, a really important step for many ethnic and racial communities to, to sort of have these groups that can do that work so it's coming from within, right? It's not something that they feel like um, they're being told from the outside. Thank you. We do have a few um, resources that have been shared in the Q&A. And so for those who are um, part of the Zoom webinar, if you joined it, joined this conversation through Zoom, you may be able to see those in the Q&A. So um, someone put the Charlotte Fryer dissertation in there, which is titled Reclaiming the University of the People. She also has a website, uncofthepeople 
www.mikeogle.com. And Mike Ogle has a, um, a Google Drive um, document called A Case for Reparations at UNC, The Life and Murder of James Cates. John Chapman has a publication from 2006 called Black Liberation and the University of North Carolina. That's also a dissertation. Um, there's the Black and Blue Tour, Virtual Black and Blue Tour, which is blackandblue.web.unc.edu. And um, there is a website, unchistory.web.unc.edu, which also has a lot of information on building names and campus history. And I know that that was a question that we also received. But I, um, again, if you can go to the Q&A, people are posting helpful resources. Um, and maybe only I can see that or Shauna, but we will try to actually um, post these resources on our Team Advance website as well. So if you look up Team Advance or Google it, you'll be able to find those resources later. Shauna, did you want to ask a question? Sure, and so I, I probably uh, will just say that we will likely not, we have actually quite a few questions and we've been trying to merge questions to make sure that everyone's question is answered, but there may be some questions that we are just not able to get to today, which really begs the question of, this is and needs to be an ongoing dialogue. Um, again, followed by action and change, but that there needs to be a continual space around uh, discussion of these issues. And so one of the, one of the questions uh, was around what are, uh, where are spaces on campus where uh, faculty, students, staff can come together to discuss these issues? Uh, one thing I've seen is that a lot of departments are starting to have more open town halls and conversations, um, which I think is a start, right? It's only a start because, of course, every conversation is only as good as the uh, people who are thoughtfully participating in it. Um, but I think that uh, it seems like there is this um, this swell of of work being done at that level uh, within the different units. That's just one, one place, of course. Uh, Center for the Study of the American South under the direction of um, Linda Mayer Lowry is, and, and the work they do with the journal Southern Cultures, that's critical ethnic studies, kind of virtual home on campus um, and place. So, I think that folks should check out the website. There are lots of resources, lots of conversations going on about not only this moment, but the Global South in general. So that's, that's a space. I hope that our department is and, and always will be, at least American Studies, a place for these conversations to happen. Um, so I am currently um, answering, but not really answering actually, the questions in the Q&A. And if we do that, I think that the resources will show up. Also, Maria Estorino, who's the director of Wilson Library, has been responding to questions and sharing resources. And I believe she said that she is available um, in terms of connecting people with the collections because there's a lot of archival material there um, related to university history. Shauna, uh, looks like we're almost at our time. Um, <laughs> so this has gone by pretty quickly. I, we did have a question about, just to our panelists, um, about resources. So are there resources, books? If you had to name one book or article, website or film that you think would be essential to read or view at this time, uh, please share that with our audience. I'm happy to jump in. I think that, um, as a story in the Equal Justice Initiative out of Montgomery, and that's a, that's a, that's a big thing. Um, they have two museums, but they have all sorts of pamphlets and guides available on their website. But it's unlike anything I've ever seen before. It seems to me that in this region, we've got sort of two different waves of how we've studied our history. One in a way that promoted and celebrated white supremacy, another that tolerated our presence as people of color. And then this is a third wave that's looking to push us into something beyond this, into reconciliation. And they are just so transformative. I'm just so impressed by them. But the Equal Justice Initiative, their website can help guide you to, to different sources. 
What about other resources from our panelists? There's a really amazing kind of black critical and creative renaissance going on in the triangle right now. Um, I'm thinking of um, Jackie Shelton Green, who's our laureate. I'm thinking of Michelle Lanier, who's a graduate of our folklore program here, who's running a listserv for uh, performers, artists, um, writers. Um, I feel that the arts need, are so important in engaging critically racism on campus, racism in our communities. Um, there have been brilliant projects about um, policing in particular, coming from arts organizations in New Orleans, in um, North Carolina. Um, those are just the two places that I know of at, at this point I'm most familiar with. And so what I can do is make sure if you go to the American Studies site, I can promise in the next week, um, by next week this time, we'll have some resources up um, in relationship to creative arts in particular. Um, Thank you. And so I know that we are in a moment of Google Docs created around anti-racism resources. And so, you know, there are uh, voices that have, have been uh, talking about these issues for many, many a decade. And now uh, a broader uh, population is focused on the work and these issues, but that uh, as we learn about and discuss these issues, I also want to make sure that we use the resources and that these resources lead to active engagement. Um, and so uh, we can post some of the resources uh, that we have via Team Advance website, but I do also think it's important for us to not just think about uh, learning and reading, but how can we make this something that is an active engagement that leads to uh, systemic change. Absolutely. Um, I just want to thank all of our panelists for taking time out of your Monday morning. Thank you to all the attendees. We had 500 people registered and over 150 people, I believe, on YouTube streaming, streaming this event. So to reiterate what Shauna said, there is a demand for these conversations and we hope that our leadership and our faculty uh, we'll continue these conversations. Um, and again, we will be posting some resources on the Team Advance website, which is located in house on the Center for uh, Faculty Excellence's website. So thank you, everyone. Enjoy your day. And, um, you know, I think it's just important for us to all continue to be allies, to continue to do this work, um, to, to challenge. Um, various forms of oppression and inequality. So thank you again. Bye. And also, I want to thank the panelists. So the panelists uh, for this, uh, this is a labor. This is uh, during the summer, during a pandemic, right? And so we appreciate that you were able to uh, join us today, um, not just sharing your, uh, you know, your perspectives as a scholar, but also your personal experiences. And again, uh, both Key and I thank you for being able to join us in our discussion today. Thank you, Sean and Kia. Thanks. Thank you very much.